Hi everyone. Because we don't have a new number 9 episode this week, I thought I'd run a wee Q&A session to help tide us over until the next one. Because I've got nothing better to do, plus I am obliged by YouTube to offer a ritual sacrifice to the great algorithm gods. Praise be unto them. And this way is a lot less messy than the alternative form of sacrifice shown in Mr. King. So I got a surprising amount of responses in my community tab over the past week, and I'll try and answer as many of them as possible. Apologies in advance if I don't get round to yours, but hey, maybe we can do this again sometime if there's nothing else on the telly. So, I've got my questions, I've got my bourbon and coke, so here we go, waffling on about inside number 9 for the next I don't know how long yet. Zachary Carr asks, how do you feel about the American remake that's just been announced? Do you think it's warranted or is it destined to end up in the graveyard of botched American remakes of classic British TV? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how to feel about it just yet. I think we're all a bit cautious because, well, it's important to remember that not every American remake is automatically going to be terrible. When they fail, they fail hard. I don't know if you've seen that awful Inbetweeners remake or the McSpaced pilot, which was terrible as well. And they tried to make Peep Show twice and they failed. And even when there's a lot of talent behind the project, like the Utopia remake, Sometimes it still doesn't work, so I'm really not too sure about this one. I mean, it might be good. It could be a really good opportunity for American actors to try out some of these roles. Maybe even bring something a bit different to them, who knows? Apparently it'll be based off Reese and Steve's scripts, but they probably won't be acting in them. I'm sure those scripts are strong enough to stand on their own, but, you know, won't quite be the same without them, will it? I think the question here is why this is being made, and no, I'm not just talking about the money. I mean, what's the point of remaking them in America rather than just showing the originals in America? I'm really not sure how most of these episodes would benefit from an American setting, or getting a bigger budget, or a longer runtime, but we'll wait and see, I suppose. Sure, they might get some interesting cast members because they've managed to attract some amazing talent in the UK, but I guess we'll find out. And don't forget, even if it's terrible or completely pointless, then we've still got the originals to watch over and over again. Bombsite asks, If you could change anything about any episode of Inside Number 9, what episode would you pick and what would you change? Okay, I've got two ideas for this one. If it's a small change, I might change the very last scene of Private View, so instead of Reese's character being the one in the interviews at the end, it's Fiona Shaw's character, only she's looking really sleek and groomed and probably in a black polo deck or something and maybe putting on more of a London affect. I don't know, I just think her being in the ending would make a little bit more sense to me. For a bigger change, and this would completely change the whole point and the meaning of the original episode, I would have completely changed Thinking Out Loud so that the whole story is between Aiden and Angel, but their father and daughter. The idea that she's a social influencer who's spending her life talking to the camera and trying to put on the image of being someone authentic and sincere, and maybe she's hit and burnout, as so many YouTubers seem to do. And then at some point she discovers these tapes that her father's made her before he died, and that's something that really is very personal and touching, and maybe, maybe that changes her outlook on things. I don't know, I haven't thought about it all the way through, but I think that would have been a nice story. Plus, Reese's scenes in that episode were some of my favourite, brought a tear to my eye, um, those are fantastic. Faith Peril Genie DA says, sorry if these have been asked already, but number one, what are your favourite and least favourite episodes for each series? Okay, here we go. So for series one, I think my favourite is either Tom and Jerry or The Harrowing, depends on what mood I'm in. Least favourite would be Last Gasp, although I do still like it. Series 2, you know it already, 12 Days of Christine. Least favourite, um, probably Seance Time, really enjoyed that one though. Series 3, that's a hard one, so many good episodes. I think my favourite is either The Devil of Christmas or Riddle of the Sphinx, you know, all the horrible ones. Least favourite. I really want to say pass. Um, probably the bill, and I hate saying that because that one's brilliant. Series 4, best one, that's easy, Bernie Clifton's dressing room. 
amazing episode. Love it to bits. Least favourite? It might be and the winner is, and I hate saying that because a lot of people criticise it, but I think it's hysterical. But again, that was a, that was a really good series. Series 5, my favourite was Misdirection. Really like that. And my least favourite was probably Thinking Out Louds, which, again, there was parts of it I really, really loved. Um, I hate picking my least favourites. And Series 6, um, I don't know if you've seen my rankings video for that, but that remains the same. How Do You Plead was my favourite, Last Night of the Proms was my least favourite. And it's too early to call Series 7 yet, but great start so far. Looking promising. Question 2. If you could have been in one episode, which one would it have been? And which existing character would you play? Um, that's a really good question. And this answer might surprise you a bit. I would have liked to have been in Simon Says, but as the Gavin character. Um, maybe call her Gavina or whatever. You know, that was the non-toxic fan who had some really nice ideas for the show, really wanted to get involved and got killed. Anyway, I'm not much of an actor, so I think that would suit me. That's maybe a little close to home. And I'd get to be fake killed by both Steve and Reese, which is a bit of a novelty. Yeah, I'd let them kill me in an episode. That's not weird, is it? And the third question is, have you ever dreamt about the show and what happened if so? You know, I'm pretty sure they have appeared in my dreams from time to time, which is going to happen if you're just obsessively watching the show the way I do. But I can't really remember any interesting stories happening there or anything like that. My dreams are just a jumble anyway. It's almost as if my sleeping brain just has no regard for continuity or storytelling. So no interesting stories on that front, I'm afraid. Sorry. Hazel Jaffrey asks, We know what you consider to be the darkest number nines, but what do you think are the funniest? And they say, for me it's Deadline, the meta humour and Steve's She told me that just make them cackle every single time. Um, cause I really like Reese doing the angry hokey cokey in Zanzibar. And um, from the last episode, Mr King, I've also added the phrase hairy meat whistle to my vocabulary, so that's another one. Basically any line that Jack Whitehall came out with in La Couchette. That was some great cast in there. Um, there was great lines in The Understudy which kept coming up when I was actually watching a production of Macbeth quite recently and I had to restrain myself from shouting FUCK ME IT'S A GHOST! And The Devil of Christmas is really funny as well, you know, until it's not. Okay, Mario Bowser 494 has a few questions. First up, favourite number 9 episode, which isn't 12 Days of Christine. Okay, the, the way you said that really made me laugh because I remember going to see the number nine guys at the Barbican last year when they were promoting the Inside Inside Number Nine or the Insider's Guide to Inside Number Nine book. And at one point they were being asked to talk about particular episodes, they were just drawing them out of a hat. Um, Reese picked up 12 Days of Christine and started getting really angry about it. He's like, oh, 12 Days of Christine, oh, that one's brilliant, oh, Sheridan Smith, oh, she's so good in it. And he just refused to talk about the episode. And I don't think I've ever seen anyone get so angry about a really good thing that they created. But that's become a bit of a running joke now. Anytime 12 Days of Christine gets mentioned, me and my fiancé are going, oh, 12 Days of Christine, oh, it's brilliant. Okay, so favourite episode apart from that, um, Bernie Clifton dressing room absolutely brilliant. Still brings me to tears every single time. Um, I read an interview with Steve Pemberton a while back where he said he actually wants the song Tears of Laughter played at his funeral and I'm sorry that, that thought's just too sad. No, Steve, you, you can't die. Not, not ever. Reese, Reese too. You can never die. And another question about least favourite number nine episodes. Just answered a bunch of them. That's really difficult, um, especially since I'm making a point and I made a whole video about this to say that even the bad episodes of Inside Number 9, quote unquote bad, still aren't bad, they're just not as good as the rest of them. So it's really hard to answer that, but yeah, personally, for me it's probably Last Night at the Proms and I think that's more of a personal thing. It just kept giving me flashbacks to a load of Brexit-related arguments that never really got resolved and just made me feel very tired and upset with people they care about. And yeah, I didn't like being reminded of that. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad episode, I'm just saying I enjoyed it the least, 
probably mostly for that reason. Okay, and scariest horror movie. Um, for me, it's still The Exorcist. Sorry if that's boring. Um, but I don't think I've said before about my experience of watching the film for the first time and the impact that that had on me. So many years ago, I'd got a copy in VHS because it was on sale and I'd heard it was quite good. And I'd spent most of that day assembling um, a futon bed and I'd done quite a bad job of it. So I was watching the film from this bed that is shaking and rattling about. If you've seen the film, then that's not a good thing. And also, unbeknownst to me, I was coming down with a really nasty glandular fever at the time and I was going a wee bit doolally. So anyway, I'm watching the film. It's really good. There's a lot of things I'm finding scary about it, but there's one thing in particular, and I think I've mentioned this in my video, made a whole video on The Exorcist, but it's this white face that flashes on the screen and it's horrible and I hate looking at it to this day. And at the time when I first saw the film, because it happened so quickly, I wasn't sure if I'd actually seen it or not. So that was playing with my mind already. So anyway, it gets to the end of the film. I'm just sitting back, listening to tubular bells, letting the credits roll, and that's it. So I think. And by this time it's about two or three in the morning. I'm very feverish. And what happened next was that face I just described appears right on the screen, staring and gurning right at me. And I nearly shat. See, what I didn't know at the time was that there was a documentary feature after the film on the tape. And there was no mention of this on the box or anywhere. Complete surprise. Um, the documentary was very good, actually. It was the Mark Kermode one, um, The Fear of God. If you're an Exodus fan, absolutely check that out. Be ready for the face. And yeah, I've never forgotten that. And it's weird because since then I'd really gotten into the film and I'd hoped it would demystify it to know exactly what that face was and where it came from. I know now it was um, an early makeup test with Eileen Dietz, who was Linda Blair's body double. And yet I still can't look at the bloody thing. It's actually on the front of a book I own about The Exorcist. And any time I'm reading that or doing research on, it has got to be face down on my desk. I hate, I hate it. I hate that face. And they've also asked favourite animated movie. Uh, of all time, probably Watership Down. If you're a League fan, you're probably hearing pop right now. It's an amazing film. Always loved it. Got beautiful animation, r really great music, great storytelling. Um, got the great John Hurt doing the voice acting as well. That was the first film I was, well, not saw him in, but heard him in. And yeah, absolutely wonderful. Really violent as well. Really, really violent. Other animated films I love. Um, most of the Studio Ghibli ones I've seen. Uh, Grave of the Fireflies in particular. And more recently I'd seen a really gorgeous animated film called Song of the Sea. Absolutely check that out. Gorgeous film. Wonderful. Michael Reffold asks, What do you think is the most inventive or original use of the Inside Number 9 concept? i.e. the most surprising number 9 location in an episode to date. And are there any you can think of that haven't been used yet? I think the most surprising one for me was the shoe in Diddle Diddle Dumpling. That episode was genius and to think it all came from the idea of just finding a lost shoe and what that might represent. I don't know how they'll do that one in the American remake because American shoe sizes are different, aren't they? I can't really think of any really inventive ones myself. Although I remember one of my subscribers once suggested a number 9 bus. Don't know what they do with it, but that could be interesting. Or maybe it could be a car in one of those fairground rides. I always think it would be horrible to get stuck in one of those. Plus I've seen a load of videos about roller coaster accidents on YouTube, so yeah, that could end up being quite a grim one. Really weird the things we watch on this channel sometimes, am I right? Nathan Gillian, not Nathan Fillion, asks, who would you like to see as a guest star now that Mark Gatiss has appeared? Because I've always been asked this question and I've always said Mark Gatiss is who I'd like to see at number nine. And that's happened now, so I need to pick someone else. Um, a few names come to mind. It'd be good to see maybe David Tennant or Peter Capaldi or Kelly MacDonald, I'm on the Scots. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, it'd be great to see. Really loved her in Fleabag. Um, think she'd be a good fit for number nine. Matthew Holness, probably most famous for playing Garth Marenghi. 
And I don't even know if he does that much acting now. I know he's a director and I've yet to see Possum, but I've heard that was a really good film. But yeah, it'd be nice to see him in a different role. Or anybody else from Dark Place. They've had Alice Lowe, but Richard Ayoade or Matt Berry would be brilliant. Maybe Chris Morris, and no, he doesn't really do as many TV appearances now. I think the last thing I saw him in was the IT crowd, but he's always good, always great to see. Julian Barrett, maybe. Been rewatching a few episodes of The Mighty Bush, and he was great in Nathan Barley, too, so he could be a good choice. And I think the number nine lads have said who they would like to get on the programme, and I think they said Ian McKellen at one point. Well, that'd be fantastic if that happened. I'm sure there's loads more names I could add to this, but. God, they've had some good talent on it over the years. HD Beard or Baird asks, Where do you think your attraction to the macabre, surreal and darkly humoured material you cover comes from? And you know what? I've often wondered that myself. And I think my parents might have wondered that a bit too. I don't know, I was always just a bit drawn to spooky things and morbid things when I was little. I just found that fascinating. I think some of my tastes might have been shaped a bit by videos that I used to watch over and over again, like The Addams Family, Beetlejuice, Return to Oz, The Dark Crystal, even things like Watership Down or Animals of Farthing Woods. Some pretty dark stuff now when you look back on it. I always liked their old Dal books as well, stuff like The Witches and Revolting Rhymes, all full of horrible stuff happening to children. That, and I can remember that whenever there was a scary public information film that came on the TV, that would be me hooked just watching it all. There used to be loads that would come on in the run-up to Guy Fox night, and loads of accidents with fireworks and people getting their hands and fingers blown off and stuff like that. Kind of many low-budget daytime horror films we got to watch, and I think they were even scarier for being, you know, just so low-budget and stern. And about dark humour in general, I think that it's really important to be able to laugh at the darker things in life, otherwise you might just shut down emotionally or go completely insane. At least I would. And I think that's what really drew me to Steve and Reese's work over the years, because they've always managed to find that sweet spot between horror and humour, you know, like Tubbs and Edward and the whole Wicker Man stuff. I think there's a really interesting point in the middle where you just don't really know how to react. EOJ asks, what experimental formats would you like to see number 9 tackle? Seeing as it looks like we may have an animated episode later this series, what else would you like to see? And what are your thoughts on the animated scenes from the trailer? Now, as soon as I saw the Inside Number 9 Series 7 trailer, it was the animated parts that first got me. I've always loved art and animation, I actually wanted to go into that back when I was a kid, so that was really great to see here. I don't know if the full episode is going to be animated, or if it's just little segments, as it also looks like there's some live action bits that fit the creepy kids show vibe, um, but either way, can't wait to see it. I quite like the look of the animation that they've done, as the style and the washed out colour palette sort of makes me think of the old Charlie Says films. Again, look those up too if you're for some reason into weird old British public information films. I don't know if they're going in that direction, but I won't be surprised if they do. As for other experimental formats, I don't know. Interpretive dance. I'm only joking. I had thought for a while that a musical episode might be interesting, although they've kind of done that already with MT Orchestra, so maybe not. Mr. Dr. Gilmore asks, if they ever made an Inside Number 9 live stage show, what would you like the story to be? I've thought about that before. I think it would be really cool if they did, like, two or three different Number 9s, but as a live performance. I'd definitely go and see that. Obviously, some number nines would work better than others for that. I'm thinking Tom and Jerry would be good, as that was originally conceived as a stage play. Maybe Nana's Party would be a good one as well. And I think The Bill would work quite well as a stage play. I'd be tempted to say Bernie Clifton's dressing room, but I can't imagine anyone except Stephen Reese playing those parts. It'd be nice to end on a song, though. If it was an original play idea, I don't know. Maybe they could go completely meta and play themselves putting a number 9 episode together. We'd see things like them pranking each other in the office, which apparently does happen. It could be done like a stage version of The Woman in Black, if anyone's seen that. I don't know how big an audience there would be for a live Inside number 9, but we'd all watch it, right? Yeah, make it happen. Callum, I think, asks, what is your go-to Inside number 9 to tell people to watch if they haven't seen it before? And they go for Bernie Clifton's dressing room. 
and what is your go-to number nine to watch if you have a free half hour, not necessarily what you think is the best, but just nice viewing, and it's cold comfort for them. Now, whenever I recommend Inside Number Nine, I usually try and get that person in based on their own taste, um, depending on whether they prefer horror, drama, comedy, or if there's a theme or a gimmick that would really appeal to them. One of the last people I showed it to had an interest in magic and magic tricks, so I showed him Misdirection and he loved it. In general, I think Sardines is a good starting point as it's a really good example of the humour and all the weird situations, and it's got a nice dark twist in there as well. But I really do think there's a number nine out there for everyone, and it's just a matter of finding the right one that's going to appeal to them. As far as comfort viewing goes, um, I personally like to watch Empty Orchestra because it's fun, I like the music, it's got great characters, and it's even got a happy ending. But I will say Cold Comfort is an excellent choice. Really underrated episode, I feel, and a lot easier to watch after the first time you see it so you know what's happening. Because the first time I watched it I actually had to pause the episode after the first Chloe call because I found that really upsetting. But it's much easier watching it once you know what's really going on and what's happening. But yeah, in general, for a very dark show it's weirdly good comfort viewing. Solomon Makes Films asks, what is the most insane and out of the box location they could use for a number nine? I don't know. Space! No, I don't even know if I'm joking anymore. I'm not sure how they'd do that. Um, maybe they'd be aliens coming to Earth, or maybe they'd be astronauts in a number nine shuttle. It's probably a shit idea, but it was just the most out of the box idea I could think of. Another one might be a war bunker, maybe done in the style of threads, but that might be a bit too grim given the current state of the world, and that's coming from someone whose favourite karaoke number is 99 Red Balloons. A couple of similar questions now. Dan the Man has asked who's your favourite guest star been on Inside Number 9 and who would you like to see in the show in future? And Adam Snee has asked who has been your favourite guest actor? I think Philomena Kunk will be tough to beat. Yeah, you can't beat a bit of Kunk. But seriously though, I thought she was absolutely brilliant and I liked the fact that there was more to her character than just her being ditzy. Because Donna was actually a really well adjusted, very caring person in that episode. Other guest stars I've loved, and I think were even a bit underrated in places. Um, Tams and Greg in Last Gasp, Fiona Shaw in Private View, basically everyone in Zanzibar, um, Derek Jacobi both times, and oh, that Sheridan Smith! Oh, she was really good! <laughs> Sorry, can't help myself. Ben Granger has a whole bunch of questions here. So number one, my favourite number nine is Once Removed, but I feel like I've not seen a single person talk about it, so not trying to be too general, as it could of course get its own video from you one day, but what are your thoughts on Once Removed, and do you feel like it's never talked about? Now, I thought Once Removed was brilliant, really clever storytelling, and I really loved the old man who thought he was Andrew Lloyd Webber. Weirdly enough, I think the reason it doesn't get discussed as much is because there's maybe not that much to add to the conversation, as the gimmick itself is really solid and self-explanatory, and it's maybe one that you tend to show people rather than talk about it. But that doesn't mean I won't talk about it, and if I think there's an episode that needs more attention, then you can bet I'll end up rabbiting on about it at some point. Ideally, I'd like to have a proper discussion of every single episode on my channel somewhere, eventually. Some would be in compilations, like the most disturbing, least popular, etc, and some of them will get their own thing. I'll go away and have a think about that one though, so thanks for reminding me of it. Number two. Relating to that, do you think there are any under-discussed number nines, or do you think there's no such thing? As I just said, there won't be any under-discussed ones by the time I'm finished with them, or at least that's the plan. Number three. If Steve and Reese approached you in the street and asked you to give them a location and or premise for a number nine, what would you suggest? So if they approached me in the street, I'd probably die of shock, um, but once I'd calmed down or come back to life, I might suggest a hospital ward. There's a lot of different stories that put people in hospital, so that'd be interesting. Also, they're very weird places to be around at night, especially if you're walking around. Or I'd ask them if they ever wanted help doing a library themed episode, because I'm a qualified librarian. So if they want a consultant, I think I could help out with that. I think they tried writing one before, but it didn't work. So I'd be curious to hear more about it, and who knows, maybe I could help out with that. Number four. If Inside Number Nine was allowed to do an episode based in the universe of any intellectual property, what franchise would you like to see most? 
oh, there we go. We could do number nine in space and set it in the Mass Effect universe. And the gimmick is we'll go back and show both the Paragon and the Renegade choices. Or we could do the War Bunker thing and do that with the Fallout series. Actually, I don't think either of them are into video games at all, so they probably wouldn't go for that. TV-wise, they could do Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Yes, I'm obsessed. Maybe it could be something about the cast interviews. Maybe they're conducting them and they start looking into the disappearance and presumed death of Madeline Wool. Saying that, they've already used Alice Lowe in a number nine, but if she was dead in this version, then that might not count. And of course, predictably for me, if they did anything in the Stephen King universe, I'd be more than happy. I guess we already had Castle Rock for reimagining the Stephen King stories, but that only got two series. We need more. Number five. This is a really personal standpoint, but I think that the last couple of series of number nine have been less memorable in a sense. Almost all episodes are still incredible viewing and have lots to talk about, but it feels like we don't get any true fan favourites like 12 Days of Christine or Riddle of the Sphinx that are the first ones you think of when you talk about the show anymore. Do you have any sentiments like that about memorability? You know what, I think even if that was the case for a while, that might have changed with the last two episodes. I think both of them, that's Merrily Merrily and Mr King, are going to end up being fan favourites in the near future, because the response I've seen so far has been really incredible. I also see a lot of the fan favourites that you mentioned described as overrated now, so there's probably some room for some new ones in there. Number 6. Over the year-long waits for new series of Inside Number 9, would you consider going back and reviewing series 1-4 to in the style of your weekly reviews, apart from the obvious already covered exceptions? Now, I have been asked about this before, and to be honest, I'm still not sure. Some of those episodes have already got quite long videos made about them by me, and I'd maybe just be repeating myself in places, or would I end up just doing content for content's sake? I don't know. Plus, it might be hard to give a short review of an episode that I've watched over and over again for years, in the same way that I do it for something that I just watched that week. Having said that, the completionist in me wants everything to be done properly, with its own playlist, so I don't know. Maybe when I've got no new number 9s to review at all, then that'll be on the cards, or maybe I'll feel like doing it between seasons. We'll wait and see, no promises, but I will consider it. Number 7. Do you think any number 9s deserve a direct sequel? Now, I actually thought we were going to get one last series when How Do You Plead was announced. I thought then, and had hoped, that Derek Jacobi would actually be playing the director of the snuff film from Devil of Christmas, and that the episode would show him on trial in the present day after more of his crimes were discovered. That wasn't what we got in the end, and you know what? I still want to see that episode, even though it'll probably never happen, and in spite of the fact that I loved How Do You Plead. But I would really like to see a follow one from Devil of Christmas, as that's one of the only period pieces they've ever done, and, you know, because of the way that ended. Number 8. What is your favourite ever number 9 joke? Not a joke exactly, but I do often go back to that line from Elizabeth Gadge, and what is named spelled backwards, DEMON! Also, the Tina Turner reference in Bernie Clifton's dressing room makes me laugh every time, especially when you know where that comes from. I know number 9 has got that reputation for being all dark and twisty, but there's so many funny moments in it too, like more than I can name right now. So they had eight questions, Um, missed a trick there, if you'd done one more we could have got nine. Um, But they'd also said, keep up the great work, after watching the episode and listening to the podcast, your reviews are always the next number nine content that I look forward to every week. And that's really lovely to hear, thanks very much. Connor Keke asks, if any Inside Number Nine episodes were to get a feature length adaptation with the same cast and crew, what one would you want to see expanded on? You know, that's kind of funny because even though many number nines would merit the runtime of a film, the fact that it's all delivered in one neat little half an hour just makes them all that more powerful, I think. Maybe the best ones to do this with would be the ones with really great chemistry between the actors and just letting the scenes play out a bit longer. Maybe Merrily Merrily or Love's Great Adventure would be good for that. And yeah, I'd definitely watch a longer version of Devil of Christmas, which would make sense seeing as it's meant to be a feature film they're making, or at least that's what they're pretending to do. Maybe if they mix it up with some footage of the actors out of character in between scenes, that'd be really good. Clack of the Geek. Sorry, there's an exclamation mark there. Clack of the Geek! 
says, Here are my questions. What is your comfort episode of number 9 or the episode you've rewatched the most? And for them, it's Empty Orchestra. As I said, Empty Orchestra is one of my favourite go to cheer up episodes, so snap. But I do often go back to my favourites. It's 12 Days of Christine and Bernie Clifton. And then I have a wee cry and get back to work or whatever. Do you think there should be a number 9 episode in future that goes for a sci fi tone, or would that be too similar to Black Mirror? I'm not saying they shouldn't do that, but Black Mirror's kinda got that in the bag already. Maybe they could do a crossover. I don't know what they'd come up with if they ended up working on a project together, but it could be the single most disturbing and upsetting thing ever committed to film. See, I'd watch it if no one else would. And are there any films you would recommend if people are fans of number 9? This might sound weird, but the first one I'd recommend would probably be Parasite. For a Korean film, it actually has a very similar sense of humour to Number 9, and in terms of plot, well, that'd be telling. Give it a watch, you'll love it. I also recently watched In the Earth, which has Rhys Shearsmith in it, and is very well done. Really unsettling and gruesome in a lot of places, so it depends how you like your horror. It's similar in a lot of ways to the film Annihilation, if you've seen that, so yeah, that might be worth a go. I'd also recommend Ghost Stories, that's the film by Jeremy Dyson, as it's got a dark anthology feel to it, but also a framing device that works really well. It's really quite tense and jumpy in places, so be warned. And of course, if you were into the last episode of Inside Number 9, and you haven't already, check out Wicker Man, Midsummer, and Blood and Satan's Claw, and you'll never want to set foot in a rural area ever again. And finally, one for all 12 says, This might be a bit late, but my question is, if you could choose what setting or settings would you like a potential episode of number 9 to take place in? I think I've talked about this a bit before. Um, hospital, library, space! I think I've gone through a few of those already, um, but here's another one. Maybe some sort of group therapy session would work? It could be set in one room, lots of drama, character backstories emerging, probably a bit of conflict somewhere too. I don't know how you'd work a twist in there, maybe someone's doing what Ed Norton was doing in Fight Club and just hanging out taking in other people's misery. Or maybe like that bit in Bojack Horseman where his acting students start crashing AA meetings to test their acting chops. Something like that. I don't know, I think I'll just trust them to come up with the good ideas. Anyway, that's all the questions I have for you this time. I'm really sorry if you sent me one and I've missed it, but uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. I hope you've enjoyed this bit of shameless time filler between episodes. I had fun anyway, and remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so that you can hear my thoughts on Nine Lives Cat as soon as that video goes live. Till then, good night.